Safe spaces through regenerative place making. What the hell does this mean? All right, so that's a better question. Introduction, um, I go by an artist, architect, urban designer, urban planner, urban farmer, and aquapon. What the hell does that mean? Uh, this is literally the question that I, people keep coming back to me and saying, how did you end up doing any of this stuff? Like, why are you looking at, why are you doing urban farming? Why are you, why are you doing aquaponics? Um, so I called up my mom and my, I said, I said uh, let me come back. I need to talk to people and tell them, why am I in this? And she, I called her up late night and she said, um, give me some time, I'll email you in the morning and check your email. So instead of, usually she sends like these really, really beautiful poetic emails. And this time she sent me a photo series. And it started with this. That's me on her back with my grandmother. It's me in the garden with my grandmother. Um, it's really important to say that my mom was a, art, a teacher in art, dance, and drama, but she also languages. And she always kept me on her back. At the time, single parent, um, reinforced support with um, her mother. When I wasn't at the school, she would actually take me into the classrooms. When I wasn't at the school, I was in the garden or out just doing stuff. That's me in the garden. <laughs> Can't see it here, but um, that's me on the right-hand side holding up a worm, because I discovered, oh my god, there's some things that live in the garden. It's awesome. And then I also there's some goats on the other side. So it was in the garden and in the outdoor and in the rural setting that I got my start into creativity and imagination. Me with a little saxophone, with a guitar, playing outside. Absolutely important. So my mom stepped it up. At the age of three, my mom said, we're going to Senegal, Ghana. She took me overseas and she said, you're gonna see other things. Um, so that, on the second to the far right, that's me waving like this. Um, just exploring, me eating with people uh, at a fish market. And just exposure, exposure, exposure. And my mom, I said, Mom, why'd you send me this? this? Why'd you send me this? I think I understand, but tell me. She says, well, we, we decided to plant meeting my mother and her mother decided to plant the seed very early for nurturing and exposure. So I said, I get it. I'm your garden. I'm one of the pieces in your garden. So she said, yeah, well, you're more like a weed. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, when I was thinking about it, you know, I was thinking about you growing up like a weed. And I was like, oh, OK, I know the kind of know the phrase, but like, can you clarify that a little bit more? She's like, well, you know, you grew up, you grew tall, you're taller than me, a foot taller than me, but you also started bouncing around all the place. So I would end up in the city, posted up, but also exploring music, art, creativity, and it would drift, I was just drifting, I was a nomad. So for two years, I had 15 different addresses, and she had the old school book, and she would cross out one address and a phone number, and she'd do it again, and she'd cross it out and do it again, and say, I can't keep track. But what I realized quickly is that the city was becoming my canvas. The concept of the city was becoming my canvas. And my tool was photography. Then it evolved into videography and audio. audio. But so that on the top is I scaled uh, the Manhattan Bridge to get a, land, to get a panoramic view of the city. Um, I used to just climb and find doors that were open and just get to higher views. And I got really obsessed with architecture urban planning. Um, this is at the top of uh, public housing projects in, in, in um, Manhattan. And as I was descending down to the street level, in the areas that I lived, I always kept finding and coming across these images. Buildings frozen in moments of time, and you could almost see, because of the built environment, what era they were from, and they were just frozen, and they were just locked in this death, decay, stagnation, but always with the possibility of rebirth and, and new life. Um, this is an image from when I went down to, to uh, New Orleans after Katrina. Three years later, it was the exact same. Um, so I was discovering these landscapes of uneven development. Fast forward. 
uh, started traveling overseas, um, just inspired by my mom. And this is in Johannesburg. I spent a lot of time in, in Soweto, in the squatter camps. Uh, no electricity, no power, no water. I wanted to figure out what was life like talking to folks. Um, and if you're really going to do architecture, that's a place to try and do architecture. Whereas, <laughs> like, what's the reality of life in these conditions? So creative innovation, constantly, constantly, constantly. Different materials, repurpose, reuse, re constantly. Um, and then informal economy. Tuck shops, <laughs> farmer's market, grocery stores, babysitters, daycares, so on and so forth. And I said, man, this looks too familiar. Why is it so familiar? What's the image here? 1930s, Great Depression. In the United States, Hooverville. It's like, whoa. As I was going and looking through my archives, I was finding the same images from decades ago. And innovation also. So I started going back and I said, OK, I just break out the pictures, cutting up collages, cutting them up, drawing it, rethinking, having interviews with people, and actually started talking to people a lot more intensely. So my, my photography shifted from buildings and places and absence and depression into innovation and talking to people and really getting to know people. Because that's where the source of innovation constantly is, outside of the norm of the prescriptive pathways. So, you know, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, just at Brazil, just traveling and talking to people. Um, what's learning about their identity and innovation and back to Harlem. Uh, kids looking in the 80s, trying to flip the 80s in order to be the 90s, in order to be 2015. And I was like, all right, cool, find your way. Come back to me. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then I also started dabbling into another form of art printmaking. And it just, just, then I picked this book up again. Jane Jacobs, Death and Life of Great American Cities. Classic. Last chapter, she has this, uh, this, this portion about thinking about the kind of problem that cities are. And she says, cities happen to be problems of organized complexity like the life sciences. They present situations in which half a dozen or other several dozen quantities are all happening in interconnected ways. So I started thinking about what, the problem of urban growth versus urban decline and blight, the prescriptive formula of blight, where people are valued to have, they're, they're deemed to have no value, or places are deemed to have no value, so you wipe it clean and start all over again. And I started seeing this overlay to the issue of food and food deserts and foreclosure. And we're going through this uh, the loss of jobs, and all of a sudden you have more foreclosure. Work goes away, more foreclosure. If it's, been, if it's not kept, vacant lot. Scales up, public housing, eaten away. And it becomes more of an aesthetic of oppression. This is what Oren Williams from the Center for Urban Transformation tells us. It is an aesthetic of oppression that becomes linked and associated towards different types of people, classes, demographics, and this, any other. And so I got, I was like, there's got to be a solution. This is, this is just an ecology of absence. This is really, there's got to be another way. Because embedded in this, deterioration, poverty, unemployment, health issues, really, really depressing. So, Going back even further, where justice is denied, where poverty is forced, where ignorance prevails, neither persons nor property will be safe. We're just pushing the problem around. What is the solution? So the solution is right here in front of us. We got enough social capital, human capital, natural capital, that's forms of innovation. Science, technology, engineering, art, agriculture, math, music, whatever you want to call STEAM, it's right there. And for us, with Sweetwater, Sweetwater Foundation, it's urban agriculture as a regenerative place-making vehicle. Seed, soil, water, light, there's, a, there's, there's life. So we step back and say, well, aquaponics, what does aquaponics do for us? Took an old building, vacant, harness figure site, used to be a production engine, an icon, empty space, export, work exported, people put to work, Labor, various forms of innovation, carpentry, plumbing, electrician, you know, water, biology, botany, drawing, sketching, architects, every person, veterans, coming together to transform the space through food and innovation. Trial and error, learn best, do it again. Trial and error, repeat, failure, try it again, do it again. 
lessons learned, translated, scaled up, and then the best part happened. The kids came. When the kids started showing up, we said, oh, time to know what we're talking about. Because <laughs> they're going to game you. They're going to game you, right? We asked them, what do you think about this? What does this mean to you? What, how, does, how does this relate to you? They started doing reflections, forming a circle, talking, telling us what, what, did you, what word did, did you not know? What word did you know? What, you know what a synonym and antonym, do you know what a, you know, check with thesaurus. What, we all started talking to the teachers and saying, what vocabulary list should come out of this? How are they learning? They're disengaged learners. We're trying to put tools in their hands, make math make sense, make science make sense. And we started seeing all this constant innovation coming from the kids that upped our game. So Sweetwater Foundation, small team, intimate team, but working closely with youth. And then we have international exchange students from Mumbai show up, from overseas in Europe. The more they did it, the more they cared, the more they found themselves into the work. Um, artists here, local artists like Jeff Redman, taking the spaces and transforming the walls into murals that made the kids say, well, take the picture here. This is the best place. They found themselves in this death and decay to create new life. So we wanted to figure out how, how far down can we go? Can we go to kindergarten? And we did, all the way back up. Having a mentorship partnership between the veterans and folks that have post-traumatic stress and chemical dependency that actually found their way to mentor these kids. So a lot of death spaces, adaptive repurposes into new life. It's a couple of years from brownfield into greenhouses, and then now there's a lesson learned for outdoors, outdoor creation, and that's the current model right now in, the, in a greenhouse production. But it's a hybrid of a partnership with the veterans, with the universities, with the high schools, with everybody to collectively come back and repurpose this, this place. So another example, shoe warehouse, I'm in Chicago, extended to another city, local, regional, national, global. Took this space, ex existing infrastructure, bringing it back to life through fish, plants, different types, lettuce, basil, arugula, chard, this, that, and the other. So we said, how else can this translate? Can it go to a classroom? Can it go to a school? Can it go to the house? Can it go to the basement? And so empty spaces kept being thrown at us and thrown at us. And we started through art and through imagination and innovation, kept bringing new life into the space. It's a translatable model. And there's no real formula to it. There's a loose framework to it. There's a chaotic contextual framework. But people want to tell their story and share their stories. So all of a sudden, now we see four cities or four different classrooms and all this stuff, it becomes exponential. All of them doing this stuff on their own time, shrinking the model down, coming up with new forms of innovation, changing it per context, per place, per culture, per identity, per space. You know, on the bottom of the greenhouse, it comes out of the fish house. And bringing in the parents, game changer. Now we have a resonance and a feedback loop system. So it's going to the school, the house. This is where we're going with this bio, bioinformatic, biomedic informatics. Biology informing the system, the design of the system, the shape of the system, the size of the system, the massing of the system, the lights, the energy, the efficiency. And we're starting to translate it to new buildings, historic landmarks that are frozen, and nobody knows how to reprogram them, but we do. Maker spaces, 21st century maker spaces merging art, urban agriculture, science, technology, engineering, math, and local production. That's the future. That's where we're headed. Seeds for change, moving towards more ecological cities. It grows the neighborhood.